Alrighty, <clears throat> so after three tries of trying to make this thing work, here we are. Uh, and I'm on a bit of a roll about rambling about myself or my ideas and insights and all these sorts of things. And uh, kind of running out of steam at this point. It's almost it's almost 1 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> I've got these double bags under my eyes, but um, yeah, I went through this interesting sort of conversation last night with uh, someone who means a lot to me. And, um, well, over the span of three hours, I'm not going to do three hours. I don't have the stamina for that right now. I'm, I'm down in my last couple of giblets of water here. So um, it was interesting because for the first time in my life, I had taken the time and patience to just um, – think through, well, the, the timeline of my life. And uh, and people have numerous, on numerous occasions, told me that I should write a book about my life. And I'm like, the hell, man? Like, at the time, I was like 26 years old the first time someone said this to me, maybe 24 years old even. I was like, really? That's it? Well, now I'm 32. And, um, and frankly put, I, I'm still baffled by this, like through my research and my, my particular projects, uh, in the classical martial arts, I deal with people that they didn't start putting brush to paper until they were like 50, 60, 70. I'm only 32. Like I've got no reason to think for a second. I've got anything going for me in that regard. And, um, yeah. A few people throughout the years have basically been like, no, you should write a book about yourself. Sounds egocentric to me. And I'm pretty full of myself, so that's that's something. <laughs> um, yeah, so I kind of went through this self-reflection last night where I just, I started in my, excuse me, I started in like my, senior elementary days and just went step by step through everything in my life uh, up until now and uh it was uh, that took it like an hour and a half and then i was like all right well if we were to span back to that little narrative let's start going backwards in time then and you know i still had 18 years to to fill in there um <clears throat> so that's pretty much pretty much just just nuts like so as someone on the autism spectrum the education system really failed me and this was back around i i don't know how early this goes into um my mother tells about anecdotes about me going to school for the first time like in in kindergarten and uh and it just being disastrous and as a single mother herself she didn't know there was anything going on with me there's nothing wrong there's nothing weird up until um, I started going to school. Like, sh she didn't have any other kids. She's she's only ever given birth to one child, and that's me. Um, she's had partners that have had their own children and this sort of thing, but prior to that, there was not really a comparison. You know, at home, I was, uh, excuse me, in my, own, in my own environment, I was just a little sweetheart. I was, there's nothing, no problems, no nothing. Uh, I knew my place, I knew my world around me. There was, the adversity was minimal. And at worst, it was usually caused by other kids. <laughs> Most of the adversity in my childhood was caused by other children. Um, and yeah, so going to school, I started to really start to see issues where my mother started getting notes written home from, from school where it's like, oh, Luke's having a hard time and Luke's not doing the work and Luke's not all these things and uh eventually they started throwing specialists at me it's like specialist tutors and psycho children psychologists excuse me um and they just started you know they, they continually did a lot of sort of psych psychiatric tests on me and uh my mother's big thing was that she never wanted be me to know that i was being tested she didn't want me to know that i was different uh, in her words, special. I don't think different and special is the same thing. I was different. 
I had challenges that the other kids didn't have. Um, and at that time, I didn't have anything going for me that works uh, better than when it worked for them. Um, oh, man, I could just reflect internally on a lot of these sorts of conundrums and dynamics. And and now as an adult, I have to work on them. That's, there's no dodging around that. But it was just crazy. Like, we, uh, we moved all over Ontario for most of my childhood. I had different friends. All through that time, I had my first closest thing I would call a boyfriend. Um, for those that aren't familiar, I'm uh, I personally identify as poly or polyamorous as um, as pansexual. Uh, that is to say, I'm not especially attracted to men or women. Um, their people's sex and gender isn't a defining factor in who I'm attracted to. Um, I got the wind blowing and messing up with my, uh, I got star from in the window to keep my apartment warm right now. It's bloody cold out there and it's really windy. Just tripped me out there because it sounded like it was like bones grinding on themselves. It's kind of creepy. Um, so if you see a skeleton come over my shoulder, you know, give me a heads up. It would be terrifying. I'll, I'll see it on the screen here, but still. Um, but yeah, it just, I really struggled without having any perception that there was something wrong with me. Um, as what they they call in early autism studies a um, what is it a lack of theory, an absence of theory, and that is to say self theory. So the individual ends up being very much absorbed with themselves, but no perception of other people. I've learned that I've learned this over the years. Um, but back then, yeah, had no grasp as to other people's ideas. I'd say something and I'd be confused that they didn't agree with me. Like, really? But this is this is normal. This is this is my normal. Um, so that's really interesting in its own right. And uh, and yeah, so eventually, what was happening was uh, I was living on a horse farm at the time, and animals made a lot of sense to me. They didn't always make a lot of sense to me, but they made a lot of sense to me. Uh, more than people, that's for sure. And I personally had an affinity for trees. Even to this day, I jokingly say that I like tree mo trees more than I like people. Um, and the animals, in my opinion, are people. I like trees more than I like life, other life forms than mammals or amphibians or any of that sort of thing. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I sort of struggled with a lot of that sort of stuff, but I didn't realize I was struggling with it. I was just annoyed by other people. So, yeah, again, I didn't realize I was struggling, which is just, just, it's just interesting. It's very interesting. I just had a flashback of a whole nother series of conundrums. And, um, yeah, so we, my mother ran a horse farm, a horse boarding farm down in Ballantrae, Ontario, Canada. And uh, she, from what I can tell, she was doing great for herself. Like, we had food on the table. She had boarders at the zoo. She taught lessons. Like, she worked for herself. As long as I could remember, she worked for herself. Um, she has had other jobs um, that I can recall. But ultimately, working for herself was her thing. And she kicked ass at it. From what I can tell, my mother has always kicked ass at anything she's applied herself to. She, well, she knows her shit in an appropriate way. I know I'm not supposed to swear on these live streams. I, I regret that. Um, so, yeah, she was, frankly, a brilliant person. She still is. She's changed, but in her own way, she's still a very brilliant person. Um so yeah, we were in Ballantre there, and then uh, a rich couple came along, and they bought up our property up from under us. But they were like, um, it was, what it was was a a a, a rather um, wealthy man bought the property for his wife, in my mother's words, to get her out of his hair. Um, so there's already a, an unhealthy dynamic going on there somewhere. And uh, so initially, we got to keep the property. We got to keep living there. It was just 
new uh, new property management basically, and uh, and eventually they were like, Whew. stupid melatonin's kicking in. Um, they were like, you know, okay, well we want the farm, and my mother's response was like, okay, I'm. I don't need to sell you the farm. You, you can have the, like, you can have the business. I mean, you, you can have my, my client base. You can have my, this and that. I'll even work for you. Like my mother wasn't a very, in her position at that point, she wasn't going to be basically be like, Oh, well you can buy my business from me. No, she was, she was very understanding and knew that she didn't have a snowball's chance in hell of fighting that. So she basically offered the business on a silver platter no monetary uh, uh, compensation or any of this stuff. We just, we needed to move somewhere else. It was all that translated as. And this lady's like, oh, no, 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 you're good. Don't worry about it. And she starts sneaking around and stealing borders from, from, our, uh, from our client base and then gave us a one week's notice to get off her property. No, that's not lawful. And the cool thing about that not being lawful is that when you've got money on your side, law is a very malleable thing. <laughs> we all know this. We all suspect it. Sometimes we see people with a lot of money still fail because sometimes you just corner them properly and that's that. But in this case, no one was going to corner them properly. We were screwed. So my mother spent her life savings on a, a plot of land up north in Bancroft, Ontario the mineral capital of Canada. And uh, and we moved up there into a 12 by 16 foot cabin without electricity. We lived there for three years while we were trying to build another house on the same property, like a, a larger house. So out of the five years I lived in Bancroft on a dedicated basis, um, three of those years were in this tiny cabin a nice cathedral ceiling. It was, it's my mother's finishing touch. It was nice. Uh, and then the last two years was actually in in this unfinished house, which to this day is not quite finished, although it's come a long way. Uh, and um, now it's it's very it's very sweet. It's a very nice house, like damn nice. It's it's damn nice. Um. Uh, so yeah, that was around 1999 that we moved out to uh, Bancroft, and I was there until about 2004-ish. Um, now, high school for me was, I didn't care. I didn't give a hoot at all. I wanted to play Pokemon, wanted to play Yu-Gi-Oh cards, Magic the Gathering. I wanted to distract myself from that stuff. I wanted to sketch the whole time. Around this time, I started to explore witchcraft, um, and I was very in intensively dedicated to martial arts. Uh, there was one summer where I was grounded for the summer. I can't even remember why I was grounded, but I was grounded for the summer. And uh, and so my my days throughout that entire summer, that two months of summer break between uh, schools, I consisted of cutting wood and practicing karate. I had eight hours a day where I practiced karate. And I only had a few kata, a few sort of uh, forms to actually practice, you know, blocking form, boom, that sort of stuff. Now it's like, I don't have enough time in a single day to practice what I should be practicing. Back then I only had so much. If I were to talk to me back then, I would hate myself, <laughs> simply put. Um, but yeah, so that was around 1999 up to about 2004. The very second I turned 18, I signed myself out of school and uh, and I moved to Bancroft. My, my father and my stepmother um, put me up for a period of time and, and gave me a, a room and I had to get a job as soon as possible. And I got that job as soon as possible. Started saving money. No, I didn't. I just lucked out and some of my paychecks were enough to afford first and last month's rent on a room i still to this day suck at saving money terribly i don't know if i'll ever learn that that skill i'd much rather have enough money that i don't have to save um but being born in poverty this is 
probably where I'm going to stay. So I need to work on that. Um, yeah, so I finally moved out on my own around 2003 or four, give or take. Uh, I got a job at a grocery store in, in uh, Barrie, Ontario. That's called, that used to be called uh, A and W. Now it's called a, now it's a Giant Tiger. But back then it was A and W. I worked in the produce department. I sucked, but did my best at the time. Story of my life. My best is never actually good enough, but it's good enough to show people that I can do better. But at the time, it is literally my best, and I will bust my ass to make sure that my best is my best. <sighs> Someday I'll figure that out, and then I'll find a job that wants to keep me. But, uh, yeah, I worked at AM and under the Zaba family. When uh, or, and it was out, it was actually at this job that I met my wife to be, um, lovely young French lady named uh, Isabel, and um, can't believe she put up with me as long as she did. Uh, she deserved so much more. It's not even funny, and I can't underlie that enough. And I'd rather not cry on a live stream over this. But uh, but that's <clears throat> that was my first uh, my first meaningful girlfriend. You know, I had a couple whatevers in high school. I didn't have sex until I was eighteen, and it was literally with her. Like she was she was my first sexual partner. Um, so that's its own sort of thing. After probably less than a year, I ended up losing that job due to some freak issue with with attendance uh, I was never good at attendance to this day I'm still not good at attendance um, if I feel respected I feel my job my job's fulfilling then you're gonna see perfect attendance through hell and high water sickness and poor um, but once that starts slipping you'll start to see my uh, tardiness skyrocket and my attendance plummet it's shitty and it's something that i need to fix because i've lost a lot of jobs to this very fact i don't understand the workings behind it uh, i've heard of other people on the autism spectrum dealing with it and i feel like somewhere in there is it's a matter of me respecting something and me respecting the job or my employers or i don't know i don't know um yeah, so eventually I lost my job at, at a and m and I just took a, a took a ride up to Whitney, Ontario, up near Algonquin Park, um, to where at the time my best friend's uh, home was, and I lived with those guys for six months, and I did nothing. I did some half-ass efforts at trying to get a job uh, in the area, which there's like there's like two restaurants, a convenience store, um, a public services office, and a resort. And there was no jobs for anyone that lived up there. Like the people that lived up there drove out of there to, to have, go to a job. It was, yeah, what I was doing there was basically wasting time. And I played video games for six months and a little bit of martial arts and general lethargy, really. It's a wonder I didn't get fat while I was up there. Like, well, okay. I didn't have the money to pay for food while I was up there. So I was freeloading what food I could get while at the same time just being a freeloader. Like it's, yeah, it was pretty shitty and it was stupid of me. Um, at a certain point, my ex-girlfriend at the time and my wife-to-be, Isabel, uh, she randomly showed up. Like, we were talking on the phone for a, a little bit at one point, and uh, she was like, oh, yeah, I know, did, did I miss you, whatever. And I was, I was a terrible boyfriend back then, like a terrible shit boyfriend. And it was the typical um, young girl attached to some dickhead. I was the dickhead. Um and yeah she, she showed up randomly one day like the next day after talking to me on the phone and surprised me i was like confused and i didn't understand and 
If, get me started. I had that the better part of that year might as well have not have existed for me. There was no personal growth there. There was no understanding. No, not, nothing. And nothing. Nothing. It was just stupid. The, the whole fucking thing was stupid. I, I can't even start. I wasted so much time. I've wasted a lot of time in my life. Um, so she presented at one point that she wants to hitchhike with me up to like Halifax. Um, I personally think it's so cool now. Back then I was like, wow, what a fucking, what a chore. Like, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here being a deadbeat, lethargic, whatever, up in Whitney of all places. Like, but, but I'm sure some of the native, um, some of the native reserves in Canada, I'm pretty sure have a similar atmosphere to what I experienced in, in Whitney. Like just nothing for anyone. It's just nothing. Lethargy is the biggest curse there and boredom. So in any case, I ended up taking the bait. I ended up going on this awesome hitchhiking trip out to Halifax and I got to see my, my, uh, my grandfather out in um, Waterbridge, and Waterbridge, Waterbridge, out in around Halifax or New Brunswick, and got to meet some of Isabel's family in New Brunswick, and like we went out to PEI, which was just so lovely. For me, I could cry over this. For me to do what I did then, now, oh my God. What I would appreciate now. Uh, now I'm crying on a fucking live stream. <sighs> but back then I was so narrow-minded, so closed off. I didn't understand the world around me at all. I didn't appreciate anything. And uh, it, was, it was such an incredible trip. I would kill to do again. It'd just murder. But now... I've got debt, and I've got chores, and I've got bills, and I've got, you know, whatever. So tied down. I'd just kill it. Just give me six months to hitchhike back out to Halifax and just have a great time. And <laughs> good luck with that, right? I mean, in that trip, we, we literally walked most of the way to Aurelia. That would have been a two-day walk. We, we covered a lot of ground there. Back then, Google Maps was not as efficient as it is now. We could have planned this wonderfully. But, yeah, we could have got it to Aurelia. And we did get up to Aurelia, and we're just, we're, we detoured up to Bancroft, visited my mother, left some stuff there because we found out we carried too much shit. Uh, and just... It was such an incredible trip, and I'm oblivious to it. I don't remember any of it. Like, just terrible. Terrible. I mean, I've got anecdotes throughout the trip, but I don't remember most of it. It wasn't memorable for who I was back then, and that's dumb. Yeah, you know, we came back, and... And I was like, okay, well, I can't stay at, you know, my girlfriend's parents forever. I can't go back up to Whitney because, holy God, I don't think anyone that cared about me would let me go back up to Whitney. It was not good for me there. And uh, it's pretty incredible. Um, so I ended up getting a job at Zares. Uh, oh, that's right. Uh, the girlfriend and I broke up at the time. And. I went back to my father's place for like a week and I managed to get um, uh, a job at Zara's on the night shift, which is up until very recently, that was one of the hardest jobs I've ever done. Like the guys on the night shift at Zara's at the Big Bay Point location in Barrie, Ontario, they hustle and they hustle for 10 hours solid. Like those guys are badass. If, if any of that crew that I worked with back then are still there, holy shit, badass. Um, 
they're in, they're intense. Uh, and we kicked ass. It was one of the few jobs I could keep up on. It was one of the few jobs that, you know, I could consistently be better than someone else because we had this one old guy, Flappy, that he was just not there. <laughs> he was just, he was older and he just puttered along and probably wasn't going to lose his job for being slow. Um, so that was pretty cool. So for literally a year to the day, I worked on this night shift at Zares in, in Barrie. And, uh, and during that time, my mother actually won the lottery. Her take home was, uh, it was like a workplace lottery through her, her boyfriend at the time. Um, now husband through common law, um, their take home was $1.3 million, which sounds fucking luxurious, right? Well, now they've been on a tight allowance for the past 20 years, uh, 15 years. So no, it's not as luxurious as it sounds. Basically, you just made too much money to keep a job. Um, one of the things that people don't understand is that when you win the lottery in Canada, no, you don't get taxed for the lottery, but it does push up your tax bracket. Isn't that fun? It is still an income. So in any case, through that, I got the opportunity to go to school. My uh, my mother offered me like, or offered all the kids, uh, myself and my two step siblings, offered them um, the opportunity to go to school, like just you know tuition covered, whatever. So my I looked at a lot of things. I looked at like metallurgy. I wanted to make swords. You know, I was always really engaged with martial arts. I wanted to make swords. I wanted to do this and that, this and that. I ended up at the end of the day moving to Toronto to go to school at a um, at a martial arts school called Kageyama Dojo. Um, that translates for people that don't know as uh, uh, the school of Shadow Mountain, Shadow Mountain School, Kageyama Dojo. If we want to translate dojo as school, that could be a dissertation on its own right as to what dojo translates as and how it got there. But, um, yeah, so it was ultimately literally a year and I think like a year and a day from working at Zares on the night shift. Uh, I ended up moving to Toronto and going to this, this martial arts school. Well, I moved to Toronto and I was working at a, a bakery in the meantime. Well, we all figured out the, the pros and cons and the leverage around this sort of stuff. I was all like, you know, I'm going to go to martial arts school. I'm going to train there for a few years, become a teacher, teach martial arts. That's going to be my profession. Now I know better. And frankly put, you know, being a martial arts teacher is much less honorable and respectful than one might think. It's even in Japan, it's like, what, you can't get a real job? Or if you're doing this for a living, really, you might as well be on welfare. You're not going to be making a living off of teaching martial arts in Japan. Um, so in any case, I, I trained at the Stojo for a year while I was working a part, uh, well, full-time job, actually. I was, do, I was putting in the hours for a full-time job while training at the, this Stojo. And... Uh, and this dojo ended up sorting out a living in program, a Senchusei Uchideshi program. So it's like a, Uchideshi is like a living in program. Uh, Uchideshi literally means like inside student. So you live at the, the school. And Senchusei means something along the lines of like, to transliterate it, it'd be like uh, accelerated teaching. And so for a year, myself, three other students and the teacher all lived in at the dojo. And we ran the dojo. We trained eight hours a day. We had a weekly tutor for Japanese lessons, all, all sorts of cool stuff. And um, it made up the groundwork for a lot of who I am today. Um, now, it was also during this time that I met my personal inspiration, uh, Kasem Zugari, Dr. Kasem Zugari, uh, one week before he became a doctorate. Um, and defended his dissertation for his PhD. And uh, he took the time before a Friday night class to speak to me for about 45 minutes. Could have been a lifetime. It was, he changed my opinion about a lot of things around the martial arts in just that, that 45 minutes. And then I saw him move. 
I'll tell you, at that time, it was been about, what, uh, 16 years or so that I've been in, involved or engaged in the martial arts. It was my primary passion. It was the thing I watched for, the thing I was really interested in. Um, no matter how undercultured I was, that was, that was the thing that filled my brain was martial arts. And I came across a number of teachers and masters and these sorts of people, all self-professed, of course. And uh, and then I saw this how this guy talked, how he spoke to me, some some whippersnapper. The amount of humility and, and respect that he expressed then. And then I saw him move. And to this day, I have not seen anyone move like this. The people he looks up to, they move in a different way. It's it's in the same line. He'll eventually move like they do. But the way he moved was clear, crisp, and concise. It was expressive in its own right. I understood what I was seeing while at the same time being blown away at its precision and its meaningfulness, and its quality of movement. Uh, so he changed my life that, that evening. That was in 2008. I think it was like 2007 in like in October or November. He was in town for a, a seminar that uh, I was neither invited for nor did I have the money to go to. And um, since then, I'd been to two of his work, his two two of his seminars, and they changed everything about my training. Um, now I follow him everywhere, and every time I see him, every time I hear him talk, it changes everything uh, for me. It in the better, but. Um, in any case, that was near the end of my living in program. At the end of that living in program, in, down in Toronto, training eight hours a day, we were to go to Japan, and we did. Uh, that was August two thousand eight. We went to Japan. Me, the the three other students, and the teacher all went to Japan, and uh, that was that was something I had wanted to do for about sixteen years. At this point, I'm like, what, 22, 23? I can't remember. Um, and that was something I wanted to do for basically the majority of my life. And I got to. And I could do a whole nother video on what Japan was like. But it was pretty freaking cool. So in any case, came back from Japan with my black belt and my menkyo, uh, like license of having been able to attain what I, or been able to talk what I know, or talk about what I know, and that sort of thing. Um, the bugger about this was not too far away from the end of, uh, of my course at that dojo. My wife had, got, or my girlfriend had gotten pregnant, the same girlfriend as before. That ended up being a 10-year relationship, so uh, Isabel got pregnant with her first child. And, um, you know, I huckled down. I, I full on strapped down. And I was like, all right, well, we're doing this. Now I'm a father. And I'm going to have to just step up and kick ass. And that's that. And we returned to Barry from Toronto and uh, had a wedding. And it was, it was all very, um, strange to me it still seems very strange to think back on and i get frustrated with myself for not being more present uh, through all these things through the halifax trip through being in japan through any of this stuff i got to catch up very recently with a, a friend of mine uh, one of the students at the dojo there and, and um yeah he retained a lot more than i did i was pretty clueless so we came back to Barry. I couldn't find any decent job. So I went back to Zares. I worked in their uh, general grocery department, which was ridiculous. And then uh, I transferred to their uh, natural food department. So like organic food and health supplements and that sort of thing. And uh, yeah, my manager there was actually, and I had photographic evidence of this. She was actually framing me to try and get me shit canned to get me fired. So that was really nice. Um, so I ended up having to leave that job before they fired me. Um, 
and I went through maybe a week or two of of being unemployed and staying at the uh, uh, the wife's parents' place while we're trying to like save up for you know getting our own place because I mean young family living at our parents' place it just doesn't doesn't work for anyone right. Um, we randomly got this opportunity to buy the studio. And my ex-wife, she's she's good at saving money. She, she had the money there for it. We threw some money down. We earned some money and paid off the rest. And, um, yeah, we got this this yoga studio. Really nice place. Uh, it was called Om Sweet Om. It's not called that anymore. It's a totally different I think It's like a rental truck uh, place now. But we, uh, yeah, we acquired this yoga studio. So nice. And we did our best to take over where the previous owners um, left off. They moved out to BC thinking they could teach yoga in BC. Everyone in BC knows yoga. You, just, you don't teach yoga in BC. Um, yeah, and so we dragged that on for a while. Eventually, I needed to start taking jobs on the side. I was working as a sort of custodian at a local doctor's office. Eventually, I... Ended up signing up through uh, YMCA's Youth Quest and got a job placement through uh, through YMCA for Habitat for Humanity, which was really cool. They have an outlet called the Restore. I worked there for apparently about four months, and um, at that time, I was really I felt a lot of pressure on a lot of things I didn't understand. And even now, looking back on, I don't fully understand. But now this was 2010, and uh, and I ended up facing my first nervous breakdown, which is crazy. Like I mean, I had nothing going for me, but somewhere in there, like I fell out of love with Isabel. I don't think, in retrospect, I don't think I was ever actually in love at that point. Not till later, but something in there was just was too much for me, and I wasn't well, and I was struggling with something I wasn't aware of. Um, what I started calling the uh, uh, early life crisis, and uh, that was really challenging because I didn't understand what I was struggling with, and I ended up dumping her and throwing her out and just it was really traumatic for everyone she was like basically bedridden in depression oh right uh there was a point there where she had also gotten pregnant uh for the second time and she was back and forth on whether or not you know we were going to go through with that or not or for it or against it and um in the end, I was, I always knew that I didn't honestly have a say in that. And I, to this day, I still don't, you know, I've got a son out there because of this. And, uh, yeah, so my, my second daughter ended up being born through all this sort of struggle. Uh, and that's really messed up in a number of points. But, uh. A large portion of that contributed to a nervous breakdown I had then. And as a result, I lost my job. We lost the place. I personally went homeless, um, which was rather lovely. Um, <laughs> I see a lot of patterns now going through all this. But um, so I went homeless for about six months and I knew that being homeless in Barrie there was no opportunities there nothing to sort out nothing to get on my feet with so I ended up oh, excuse me I ended up shooting my butt down to Toronto <coughs> and I spent my homelessness down in Toronto and uh that was pretty intense. I uh, I had no money. 
I was busking for for food and and drinking money. And at the time, that's when I first started drinking. Um, that was wow. I could sit here in silence and just reflect on that. You guys can just watch my face, but I don't think that'd be very entertaining. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. So I, uh, I was almost for that period of time. I met um, someone who became an important friend of mine. I'm not really sure how I got that effect on her, but um <clears throat> we kind of think of each other as, as siblings you know she's my sister from another mother kind of thing i don't know <laughs> uh, basically i got siblings owned or brothers owned in in regards to that one <laughs> newly newly single for the first time in my life went from single to a 10-year relationship to single yeah i was trying to find a distraction there um sorry my nose is dry um, yeah, and eventually I started managing to pull some things back together, and, um, I got, I came back to Barry, lived with my best friend and another, of a bunch of other friends, and, uh, I got on Ontario Works while I was in pursuit of going to college, I ended up, um, getting on Ontario Works, so welfare basically, for uh, so that I could go through my high school education. And I was nailing the crap out of that. Like, I basically went from, hey, homeless, you know, spit idiot, to um, full-time academic. And in the time that I was doing my high school education well on Ontario Works, I was taking on an average of two university credits online uh, at the same time. Just jumped on it. Just like my brain was my biggest investment for that time. So that was a really interesting twist of character. So much so that eventually um, my wife, she was still my wife at the time. We had never gone through the, uh, the separation papers at that point. My wife at the time uh, ended up taking me back uh, just a couple doors down from where I was staying. And uh, and I jumped right into college, really sorted out a lot of stuff. Uh, that whole thing, that whole turnaround, that whole quickening and maturity that came through all that, I don't know, I guess made me lovable again. I guess she took me back and... What I felt for her then was the first time in my life that I was in love. I didn't just feel love for someone, but I was actually in love. And that was about 2012. I was in college. Uh, I was in love. I don't, uh, to this day, I don't know where she was. I still suck at being able to gauge whether or not people are interested in me. Um, but, Yeah. It was, um, it was lovely. I lived with my two girls, my kids. I lived with, you know, my wife. Um, this was also the time we started exploring uh, the kink community, and we opened our relationship initially as an open relationship, kind of, sort of, and we went polyamorous. It was actually my volition because of someone else that, I wanted her to be open to exploring a relationship with someone else. I don't know what got in my head with that. It was completely my own thought before I ever came across the word of polyamory, before I had ever even heard of open relationships. That's where that rolled. And um, and I encouraged her to, to pursue a particular uh, individual that became a mutual friend of mine and uh i thought he was super cool and and he was literally someone that she was into before she had met me and some a week or two before she had met me she actually went to come out to him to say that she was interested in him and he's like oh yeah man i'm moving out to bc with my girlfriend and so her heart was broken by the time she met me which is 
crazy messed up. I was literally a rebound. My marriage was based off of a rebound. That's pretty weird, huh? But nothing in my life is standard. So eventually, through a whole series of stuff, frankly, at this point, I have trouble even remembering the details around around 2012 or 13. Uh, our relationship fell apart again. And I was thrown out of the house. So if anyone who has doubts that I have any sense as to what it's like to be thrown out of my own house, I've been there. It's shitty. It sucks. I know what it's like. It's shitty and it sucks. And I found myself for the second time in my life homeless. Strangely, in that, that summer, and it lined up almost perfectly with summer, I managed to um, indulge in, like, work contract after work contract, like, just, like, three of them in a row. It was just, like, bam, 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 bounce from job to job to job. Um, and in that time, I made more money. I, I made so much money that... I made so much money and I worked so much that it didn't make sense to rent a place to stay. So I actually spent my weekends homeless. During the week, I was holed up in hotels by my employers. And then during the weekends, I was literally homeless. And I just went to Toronto and, and stayed homeless. It was, uh, it was strangely fitting to my particular tendencies and lifestyle. Um, Craziness. Um, eventually, I started coming back to Barrie. Um, i trying to remember the timeline here. Yeah, I came back to Barrie. And I was focused on web development at the time. I was doing that pretty much full time. There's a couple years here that grew really fuzzy for me. Because uh, I was just constantly in survival mode. But... Um, yeah, I was focusing on web development, which I had taught myself, and it was very, uh, well, it was its own creature, that's for sure. <laughs> I survived off of it, barely, and uh, learned, lived at a place down on Bristol Court in Barrie, um, with some people that I really shouldn't have spent time around. But I did. And uh, um, yeah, sometime around that time was the, the last straw, the final give up. It was around 2014 or 2015. Um, I ended up just getting a job at a call center. Uh, HGS, and I spent one year and three months there. And that's when I really learned that call centers I can work with. I'm not bad at it at all. Um, in fact, I'm quite good at call centers, but the level of dogmatic redundancy, call after call with the same crap, my brain starts to fall apart. And I can't maintain that. So I learned that's not for me in a long term that's decent for me in a short term that's for covering the bills i can do that for like four hours a day whatever but not doing it for like eight hours ten hours a day terrible so in any case uh during that time working in that job uh my relationship finally came to its climatic end uh this is 10 years into the relationship you have to understand technically nine years 11 months and two days but who's actually counting at one point i had it down to the hour trying not to um <clears throat> and uh so the the hardship from that i was for the first time in my life actually suicidal and it was traumatic and terribly damaging uh i mean for everyone involved i'm not the only victim here my uh, my ex-wife didn't go through an easy time with that either. Um, 
I do know that she had more experiences in sexual partners in that time that I was suicidal than I did. You know, she did what she had to, to, to take care of herself. And as a young, attractive single woman, she had a hell of a lot more opportunity than I did. That's for sure. Um, guys have to be on the hunt. They have to fight for it. Girls, they just have to be pretty. And they can literally get what they want. Um, the ones that don't usually struggle with self-esteem issues, uh, which are reasonable. I mean, this culture is seemingly designed to inflict self-esteem issues on us. But at the end of the day, that's, that's basically the equation there among a couple others, but that's one of the main ones. Not making it, not trying to make it sound easier or harder for either party. That's neither here nor there, but I digress. Um, so the only thing that actually held my brain together in that time was the ambition and drive to, um, to learn Japanese rope bondage. Like I dedicated a lot to that. Hell of a lot. And uh, to this day now, I, I, I teach it. Like, I mean, over there, we've got a crap ton of rope hanging off the wall and a giant freaking rig in my living room with a bunch of padded mats for the sake of comfort. Like, it's it's what I do. <laughs> it's... It's an unorthodox uh, occupation. There's maybe about 15 studios in the world that do this. I happen to be one of them, and I'm the only one uh, in northern Ontario or central Ontario that uh, that does it. The only other one in Ontario is in uh, in southern Ontario. <coughs> You'd think business would be good. There's an irony there. But... Um, yeah, so through all that time, I bounced through a couple other jobs, another call center, struggled with very various stuff. You know, I met my current partner, who is an absolute sweetheart above and beyond any measure of the word. Um, like anyone, she has her own struggles and her own work to do. She hates it when I say that, but we all have work to do. Avast needs to go away. Um, so that's kind of a running joke in my mind. She hates it when I say that, but truth be told, every last person that draws breath on this planet has work to do. It's not just just that we have work to do. It's we all have work to do. We are we're all in a a progression of our own live stream. Um, so now I find myself having found a job that I really excel at. That really means a lot to me. I actually just lost. In fact, I'm technically on sick leave for it right now because I had too much going on and, uh, I was starting to fall apart and I knew I needed to distance myself from all sources of stress. And well, here we are. <clears throat> um, I've adopted a beard. It's weird, and I should really shave my, my neck beard. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so it's, that's a large hour-long ramble of my self-reflections on my autobiography, really. I like to get nice, concise dates for that. If I were to think hard and long enough, about it, I probably could um, reference a couple different things, figured it all out. But uh, at the end of the day, life is just complicated. I prefer to be intricate. Intricacies uh, hold my attention, but. Uh, life is just one experience after another, and uh, well, it's challenging. <laughs> That's all there is to it. It's just challenging. 
So I hope that was all uh, really interesting. I imagine it wasn't. It's an hour long of me rambling about my experiences. Um, I think it's mind blowing how convoluted my life has been. And that's what makes me stop and think that maybe people, people would like to hear about it. Um, yeah. So in any case, I could draw this on longer, but it's, you know, 20 minutes to two in the morning. Um, and, uh, though I'm unemployed, I do need to find a job so that I can keep this nice apartment of mine and, uh, not go under all the bills and lose my internet access and all this good stuff. So I need to bid you guys adieu. Um, hope it was interesting. I've got no fantasy in my mind that it was, but with some, uh, with some foresight, maybe next time I'll have coffee in me and I can ramble properly. Until then, I just decided to ramble on in what I felt was a somewhat thoughtful and reflective way. And I hope this means something to you guys. So, y'all have a good night. And uh, I'm going to go crash now. Cheers.